So ever since I finished Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, I've been thinking a lot about the game's ending. In particular, spoiler warning for those of you who may have not finished it, we're gonna discuss the ending, but I've been thinking about Aerith's death and the way that it's been depicted because it is rather confusing as you're watching it because multiple things are playing out all at once back and forth. And it seems kind of weird very vague, convoluted, maybe poorly written and directed, until I heard a theory from Maximilian Dude in the Easy Allies that completely changed the way that I saw the ending of the game. And it is incredibly, incredibly dark and depressing, and now I'm kind of sad. So again, I'll leave a link to the Easy Allies page in the description down below if you guys would like to check out their spoiler mode. There's some really great conversations had between Michael Damiani, Michael Huber, and Maximilian Dude just talking about Final Fantasy VII, and they got on the topic of the death of Aerith and how it was depicted. And after Max talked a bit with his chat and they kind of opened his eyes to some things that he missed, and I definitely missed on the first go around, uh, it makes Aerith's death and how they show it make way more sense. So looking at her death, the way that it plays out is very confusing because there's one scenario where it looks like Cloud full on saves Aerith. He stops Sephiroth, pushes him back, Aerith is safe and sound, continuing to pray, everything is all gravy. But then it flips to a different scenario where no, Cloud did not save her. She was in fact stabbed and she's now bleeding out. So Cloud is holding her and he's crying, but it's cutting back and forth between him crying and him talking to her. And we even see Aerith laying on the ground talking to him like she's completely fine. However, when the rest of the party members show up, they see Aerith dying, she's bleeding out. So everyone then goes to fight Sephiroth in this 24 hour extreme battle gauntlet that was incredibly fun to play. And after everything is said and done there, we see the party gathered around Aerith's body and Cloud approaches them. And as Cloud approaches them, these whispers show up and everyone disappears and it's just Cloud and Aerith. And then cuts to the party sitting around that big body of water where they should have laid Aerith to rest. However, we don't see any of that. And granted, not seeing any of that really does take away the emotional impact of Aerith's death. However, once we get further into this theory, it replaces that and makes it 10 times darker, <laughs> in my opinion. But during this whole scenario, everyone is grieving. They're clearly sad at the death of Aerith because yes, she did die. But as Cloud is sitting there, he looks to his left and who does he see? He sees Aerith. Now, why is he seeing Aerith? So according to Max, Cloud has created this scenario in his head where he did in fact save Aerith, which is why he's now seeing her. He's refusing to accept that she is in fact gone. And that really does fall in line with who Cloud is as a character. He has a lot of problems accepting things. When Zack died in Crisis Core, the combination of not really understanding that Zack died, the Mako poisoning, the PTSD, all of the trauma that they experienced causes Cloud to have that psychotic break and he creates that new persona and he becomes that unreliable narrator. He's got his memories and experiences all mixed up. They're all jumbled together. In this situation of Cloud refusing to accept that Aerith is in fact gone and he's now seeing a version of Aerith plays even more into that unreliable narrator trope that Cloud is going through. But it makes it even worse now because not only did he, you know, forget Zack, he's now seeing Aerith. And another thing that's been flipped on its head is the fact that Cloud does now remember Zack. However, his context of who Zack is and what they did together is still messed up. He just remembers that, oh, Zack and I were best friends. We were both soldiers here in Nibelheim. That's what he remembers, even though that's still not exactly what happened. So that unreliable narrator thing is still playing out uh, the way it did in the original. It's just happening a little bit differently. So that's why Cloud is seeing this version of Aerith that no one else can see. Now, what makes this even more depressing and dark is that this version of Aerith that Cloud has created in his head, this whole scenario might not even be his own conscious doing, but manipulation by a more malevolent force. Maybe Genova, maybe Sephiroth, maybe that black material that he keeps coveting so much. And a lot of that makes sense because if you rewatch that scene where Cloud turns to his left and he sees Aerith, the way that that scene is directed, the way that the music plays, the lighting, something about Aerith in that sequence does not feel right. She feels kind of creepy, uncanny, almost like it's not actually her. And we've grown to know Aerith so much. I spent 108 hours playing through Rebirth <laughs> and like maybe a hundred just going back and forth with remakes. So we all know Aerith very well. And when you know a character very well and they start acting differently, you notice it right away. Something about her just seems really off. 
And this causes Cloud to be kind of an asshole because while everyone else is grieving, he's not. He's acting like, yeah, we're fine. Let's just get to the next area. Like they didn't just experience something very traumatic. And it goes even further when we see the party out on the field. Everyone again is, you know, trying to get the tiny Bronco fixed. Tifa's still mourning. Yuffie's still mourning. Red 13 is right by Tifa's side. And what makes this really interesting is that we see this version of Aerith again show up and she's walking around the field and she puts her hand on Red 13's shoulder. And Red 13 can sense Aerith and he says her name like, Aerith, you're here? And this is really sad and messed up because when you look at Red 13 and Aerith as characters, they have a really close bond with one another. You know, in Remake, when they first met each other, she put her hand on his head and not only did she calm him down, but she seemingly transferred information to him to let him know, hey, I know you, you know us, we're good friends, we've been through a lot and we're gonna go through even more. Much kind of like what she did with Marlene, transference of information and all that stuff. Max also mentions that the only time you see this entity, this spirit, Aerith, interact with the other party members is when Cloud is actively watching them and looking. The moment he turns away, this thing is gone. So it's like whatever this force is, is trying really hard to show Cloud, hey, I'm Aerith, I'm the Aerith that you knew and maybe fell in love with, which again is even more unsettling to think about because it's just so much evil manipulation happening. And what makes this really dark is that if this is in fact not Aerith, this is a malevolent entity like a Genova, she's not only manipulating Cloud, but she's taking advantage of that bond that Red 13 had with Aerith to get him to drop his guard. Because in the original game, they do entrust that black material to Red 13, and he ends up giving it away to the bad guys, which wasn't even his own doing. He got manipulated into it. Now, I don't know if that situation is still going to play out the same way in the seven remake trilogy because cloud does have the black materia and he's hiding it from the party he straight up puts it into the buster sword and it's disappeared it's gone so he's coveting this really awful piece of material that again we learn was born from the gi out of spite and hatred to end the world so naturally it would make sense for that to have an effect on him so the idea that this might not even be Aerith that we're seeing is really messed up and earlier in Rebirth, Sephiroth straight up tells Cloud that Genova is this creature that can take the shape of the ones you love. So it does make sense that this could be a Genova fooling Cloud into thinking that Aerith is in fact there with him and that he can trust her and he can't. But this also kind of brings into question, how many Aeriths did we actually see in Rebirth? Because there's so many theories running around of there being multiple Aeriths and multiple timelines. And I've always kind of subscribed to the idea that the OG Aerith from the original FF7 who is in the live stream is the one kind of manipulating a lot of things to try and help the party and fight back against Sephiroth. And Max even brings that up and I think he calls her Omni Aerith, <laughs> which I think is short for like Omniscient Aerith who is this all-powerful being that we might have seen multiple times within Rebirth, assisting Cloud, talking to him, having that date possibly with him. She might even be the one that shows up at the end of the game to help Cloud fight Sephiroth because she is a lot more powerful in that scenario. And she just seems kind of different. There's so many different kind of like even Advent Children isms within that section of the game and throughout the entire remake trilogy so far anyway. And just thinking about that theory of not being able to move on and accept death and having this force manipulate all of those feelings makes it just so much more of a darker and depressing ending. Because again, you have people in real life who lose people, but they're not willing to accept just yet that they're gone. Because once you accept that they're gone, it makes everything real. And that person really is gone. And sometimes they still expect a phone call from someone or a text message from somebody like nothing happened. And that's kind of what Cloud is doing right now. And it's gonna make him seem even more unreliable to the party because he's seeing someone that they can't see. So all in all, I just thought that that was a really interesting theory and it just makes the death of Aerith and how they depict it way less confusing and make even more sense and even scarier and darker. So. I'll leave a link in the description to that podcast. It's really interesting to just kind of hear them talk about these cool ideas and just geek out over Final Fantasy VII. It's so much fun to hear all the theories that people have out there because some of them do end up coming true, which is pretty incredible. But with that being said, I am Curious Corduroy. Let me know in the comments down below, what do you guys think of the theory? It does make a lot of sense to me and I'm really curious to see where they go with part three. I will see you guys in the next video. Please remember to always be excellent to one another.